Okay, so the first thing that I'd like to say, which isn't actually an answer to any question that you've asked, but it seems important, is that no one's ever asked me these questions before, and I don't know why. And in fact, it's a very interesting process, this, trying to find photogenic. <laughs> I mean, you've got one of the easiest places to, to do it. I do, I do have little to complain about in that regard. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. You've got some nice nettles behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. Better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really nice. So you were going to tell me what um, this was a. Yeah. For. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. Willish, Willow Broadsheet. Yeah. So, so as I say, this, this time round, there have just been more submissions of poetry than anything else. And so we thought we'd do an, an issue of something just dedicated to poetry. And this is, cool. kind of, this is the digital version of, you know, we would accompany it. Cool. Also, I mean, it's also it's partly selfish in the sense that these are questions that occupy, you know, my thinking and teaching more and more. So I thought it might be nice to hear from other people their thoughts about it and then I can you know help me help me to reflect a bit as well from a brief scan of the questions they look absolutely awesome the questions I mean just such good questions to think about well that's why I was thinking basically you know the idea is it's just completely conversational and that these questions I didn't want to have a sense of driving you to any particular answers by my questions but yeah yeah sure leaping off points so that if if at any point the conversation feels like an intimidating one like you have to answer you know what is poetry or something then you can have a, 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 a way of diverging into something else. But um, why don't I just read them through so that they're in, like, fresh in our minds? Do you read poetry? How do you read poetry? In Biographia Literaria, Coleridge's first mark of a good poem is one that is returned to with pleasure. What poems do you return to out of joy? And I've put rather than, than necessity, and what I mean is rather than, you know, so that you can teach it or whatever to draw you know draw something from it to make a point has a poem ever changed the way you think or the way you orient your life uh what does poetry do that other forms of thinking don't do do you see a relationship or connection between poetry and your faith can you give me one or two lines of poetry that capture something vitally important to you what is religious poetry have you ever written poetry what kind of comparison can be drawn between poetry and prayer? Are there problems with reading poetry as theological thinking? What can poetry help us to know? Uh, then there seems to be a natural assu or assumed relationship for people between poetry and mysticism in Christian tradition. How do you make sense of that relationship? Uh, is poetry essential to a life of faith? Can you recite a poem off by heart? Uh, as you may know, in Protagoras and the Republic, Plato sees an inherent dishonesty and misleading ambiguity. I put in poetry, but in poets and poetry. Should we share his caution before thinking of poetry as a vehicle for truth? So those are the ones I've laid out, but you can nip in and out of whatever. They're so cool, Kate. They're such great, amazing questions. And I feel like I'm not going to know where to stop because okay so the first thing that i'd like to say which isn't actually an answer to any question that you've asked but it seems important is that no one's ever asked me these questions before and i don't know why and in fact i've never asked almost anyone these questions either that is to say i talk very little about poetry and think very little about it compared to how much um, to what a fundamental role it plays in my life and in the formation of me as a person, both historically and in the present. And that strikes me as deeply odd. I'm not sure why that should be. I'm not a person who has ever thought of poetry as an academic, a topic of academic study. 
I mean, it's not that I've deliberately chosen not to, it's just I haven't approached it that way. And yet it's been absolutely pivotal in me coming to be who I am and shapes the whole way that I view the world. And yet all of the questions that you asked me, each one of which I could speak about for hours probably, I don't pose to myself or anyone else. So that's the first thing that comes to mind is thinking how curious it is that that's so and how precious, precious is, is, is to actually think about it and talk about it. The question that really attracted me straight away, so much so that I was then struggling to actually think about anything else, was if you had to name two lines of poetry or a few lines of poetry as being absolutely vital, what would they be? And I just, I mean, I literally, my mind floods and I don't know where to begin or where to end or where I just, the mind floods. But to give you a few, because I don't think I can do one, but to give you a few, Interestingly, the one that came to mind straight away is the first line of one of first two lines of one of D. H. Lawrence's poems. Not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. And that captures to me something of what poetry does for you, or does for me, that relativizes that it relativizes my sense of self it kind of reintroduces me to reality being so infinitely much more and greater than me in a way that feels intrinsically redemptive. And actually I often think, and I, I think I've learned this from poetry in part, that that's what redemption is, is realizing that your reality isn't the only reality and that that's redeeming all by itself. And in that connection, just while I'm on D.H. Lawrence, who I'm so fond of as a poet, there's another two lines that he has bequeathed to me, which I carry genuinely, I carry in my heart, which are the last two lines of his wonderful poem, Snake, which I just, is one of my favorite poems ever. And he talks about having an encounter with the snake uh, in the poem and the kind of majesty and, and, the, and the, the terror as well of, of this encounter. And at the last moment in this meeting with the snake, he loses his nerve. And he lets the fear and the horror repel him. And he kind of throws something and the snake rushes away. And the last two lines of the poem are, I have missed my chance with one of the lords of life. And I have something to expiate, a pettiness. And somehow that to me captures the same thought, but in reverse that we can miss the encounter with reality and we can make our own little reactions more important than it. And that that's fundamentally petty. It's a kind of smallness. It's not even a grand sin. It's just a tiny little petty smallness of heart that we can't bear reality because it's not in our control somehow. The snake wasn't in his control and yet it had this, this uh, tremendous majesty about it, but he couldn't take it. And somehow that's the opposite of those those other lines, not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me, that really allows the, the person to be totally taken over by the thing that's being contemplated. Anyway, I think um, to connect that with one of your other questions, that that's what, for me, poetry has to do with faith. It is something about that sense of encounter and of being taken out of yourself and as a result of that, in fact, returned to yourself, but freer and, and larger. Um, and I think uh, and, and that's obviously the connection with prayer as well and I think I probably never pray so well as when I pray with poetry and I don't mean in the sense of opening a book and this is touching on the question how do I read poetry I almost never think right I'm now going to read some poetry and I sit down and open a book mm. that's rare it's more like you're going around life you're doing the things that you do and suddenly the poems that are in your heart start speaking and you don't really know why, but you have a choice whether you stop and listen or just carry on. And that stopping and listening and being in that voice seems to me um, a terribly profound uh, and real communion with the world and therefore with God. Mm -hmm. And sometimes 
when kind of formal law, if you like, to be a bit unfair, pious prayer, obviously, like explicitly religious prayer, if is for some reason difficult. Praying with poetry is never, never impossible for me. Mm. Even if it doesn't always feel like prayer with a capital P at the time. Um, and so going back to how do I read poetry, the best, the best, the thing that I most love to do is to memorize it. Because what I really want is to have it in my heart so that it speaks without me really calling out to it, it just starts speaking. Yeah. So for an, there's an example maybe of a poetry that is a poem that is a prayer and that is expresses something of how I think poetry enhances the experience of the world uh, in that self-transcending way, which is that I live by the South Downs and I climb a hill and when I get to the top, almost whatever time of day it is and whatever kind of day it is, the same lines come to me from on Westminster Bridge the poem, um, Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. And that's an example of poem, poetry just penetrating what is in fact ordinary experience, but is really extraordinary experience. And the, the poem reminds one of that. Mm -hmm. And I think all of the important places and feelings in my life are accompanied by, by poetry in that way. It's so funny saying these things because I've never really stopped to think about it, but it's just, uh, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Always. Is it something that feels in that way separated from the kind of thinking that you do, they, you know, in your, in your academic life? Yeah, so that's a really interesting one. So, yes, it does feel really different. Um even though I think poetry is the more fundamental uh, of the two modes, and it's the one that actually feeds the other one, as in it's the poetic sensibility that feeds the academic one for me and not the other way around. And I think actually probably my love of study post-dated my love of poetry by quite a long way. Um, what's different about it? I'm tempted to say, I've been thinking about this for the last 10 minutes since you asked the question. I'm tempted to say that it's something to do with having a soft focus instead of trying to gain an undue precision. But that doesn't seem quite right because poetry can be immensely precise, far more precise than almost any other kind of speech. So I don't think it is a soft focus. I think it's not mainly trying to make absolutely true statements. It's mainly trying to report or express or reflect on experience somehow and it has for that reason the kind of first person authenticity that study doesn't even try to have mm -hmm. but which i think to repeat is really far more far more fundamental than your kind of classic detached intellectual mode that people are expe expected to exercise in an academic way mm -hmm. and it's interesting that that seems to tie in as well with your sense that poetry comes back to you you know that if you memorize poems then they appear at the time when the experience fits the the the, the, the language you know that that um you know your experience of climbing the hill that those words arise because they fit an experience rather than being you know part of a thought process in that sense that right a, absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. and at the same time they modulate the experience it's that mysterious thing that they come up because they fit it. But then on the other hand, they also shape the way you're able to receive it and you experience things differently because of them. Mm -hmm. And actually in that connection, I just want to say quickly, I think this is actually this very, very close to my relationship with um, the Bible. That the, it functions in a poetic way for me except interestingly for some parts and some books of the Bible, which for one reason or another, I've kind of got an academic way with that it's really difficult to let go of. But there are bits of scripture that behave in my head and heart in the way that poetry does. And in fact, are obviously poetic, you know, and they might have been written as poetry, not always, but often. Um, uh, can I recite poetry? 
tragically little, but I can recite some. <laughs> I tend to end up with little fragments that for one reason or another speak particularly vividly. And I don't make nearly as frequent an effort as I really would like to, to memorize new poetry. I often find that the poems I remembered when I was, you know, 18 are still the poems I remember and there aren't that many new ones. Mm -hmm. And that's something I would, would, would profoundly like to correct, but it's a often renewed and so far ineffective um, resolve. <laughs> Okay, well, one, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I know that um, I promised only 20 minutes. But um, to, I, I'm also being chased because I'm now in the way, apparently. <laughs> in the way of... In this whole massive place, I'm in the way. <laughs> <laughs> building a new path or something, or a new bar. Yeah, he's building a path alongside the um, uh, children's barn. And apparently he needs to cement out of the shed that I'm sitting next to. Okay. Um, well, uh, and then two, two things would be, um, uh, one, one is um, the, the question that was in among those that I said earlier, is poetry essential to a life of faith? I mean, it's a slightly provocative question, obviously, but, and then the other thing is just as a final note, you know, what would you say, go and read or go and learn to anybody watching? Oh, wow. Wow. Is poetry essential to a life of faith? Um, I find a faith that isn't poetic almost completely unrelatable. But I'm also aware that there are some people who, many people in history, who might have been exceptionally um, literal minded, shall we say and have no poetic sensibility and very occasionally I meet them and it's always astonishing. I feel like I'm meeting some rare beast from, you know, a far off land. Um, and that, and they seem to have a living faith. So I feel like it's not essential, but at the same time, it, it unsurpassably expresses something that is essential to faith. If that's not too fine a distinction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also can say with confidence that it is essential to faith for me. Mm. And if there was something that I, I, I could tell people to go and discover, it would... I would, <laughs> I would always want to know if a person was reading Hopkins. And if they weren't reading Hopkins, then I would wring my hands. <laughs> um, and after Hopkins, E. e. Cummings. Mm, interesting. That's an interesting choice. Who I absolutely have been shaped by so deeply. Mm. I think that one of the most amazing poems in my life of all time is I Thank You God for Most This Amazing Day. Mm -hmm. Um, so Hopkins and Cummings are my kind of, you know, can't do without them people, somehow. That's interesting because I think there's a real similarity in form, in, in, you know, I, although they're totally different in form, there's a similarity in, in the way that they are so playful with language and positioning and, you know, creating multiple ambiguities and, you know, that I just think that, yeah, 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 there's this, I can see a tie between the two. I've always felt that they were, and I've never actually articulated this before, but I've always felt that they were siblings, spiritually, even though Cummings was actually a sort of pantheist character, mm. who was very in influenced by Whitman and the Transcendentalists and everything. Um, you know, and so in human terms, they seem miles apart, but they both have such an incredibly deep feeling for nature. But more than that, even, as you say, they have a kind of... That's really annoying. <laughs> Just quickly. They yeah. have a kind of reverence for the sacramentality of language, mm. both of them. Yeah. And I think that's what they have deeply in common, even though that's obviously not language that Cummings would have recognised. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
and I actually I'm, I'm think now I'm thinking about it I realize that I actually do prefer the prefer them to the more explicitly religious poets like George Herbert and W. H. Jordan yeah who I also love yeah <laughs> there's, there's a, a poem. There's a man I've taught poetry to. <laughs> I think he's come to tell me that the interview is over. Yeah, yeah I, I can't continue until I use the saw for a, a couple of minutes. Look at you, you look like such a jock. You're sweating. <laughs> I've spent the whole afternoon playing racket sports with Benny, feeling not very jock-like, but he looked very jock-like. Oh, right. I'm very. I'm really impressed. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, quite right. <laughs> it's now evening time and that is time for poetry, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's really, really lovely to talk about it and this. And uh, really, really quite wonderful to have an opportunity to talk about it. It makes me realise just how much I think about it mm. all the time and yet somehow it never becomes part of my public persona. Mm.